am reading this morning from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it's not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will, who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thank you, Deacon. Thank you, Michael and Karen and choir for amazing worship. Yeah. Becky Thorne, you're around here somewhere. I think she stepped out. There she is. Thank you for that beautiful solo. Good morning, church. It is good to be back in my home church here. You know, it's nice to travel every once in a while and go on vacation. And often when we go on vacation, we go and visit other churches, but you know, it's good to be home. It's nice to be home in a church that lifts up worship, still has a pipe organ, children's church, all these important things uh, that to me resonate so deeply with me. And I'm very thankful to have an amazing music worship minister who can also preach. Thank you, Michael. You know, there are power, there's power in the things that we say out loud. There's the power to heal or hurt. There's the power to destroy or to edify. There's the power to shape truth or to continue to go into a, or denying the truth. You ask any counselor and she will tell you that the most important part of helping someone is when that someone can articulate and say exactly what haunts them. I've seen this many times in my own meeting with people. I'll meet with people who may have an issue or have a problem, and they heat haw and they beat around the bush. And then as soon as they say something that is true for them, that is meaningful, that has held them in bondage, it seemed, there seems to be a release. There's a release of tears and a release of bondage and the shackles that hold on to people. Sometimes I'll talk with somebody and for 45 minutes, they'll 
go back and forth and finally have to say, well, what scares you the most? What is it about this that hurts you the most? And when they put words to the things that haunt them, it is as if freedom and liberation comes, and finally we can get on to the work of healing. Other times, people come in and they believe something about themselves because people have spoken falsehoods into their life. I can't tell you how many times people come in and they'll say things about themselves that just aren't true. Aren't true biblically, aren't true from Christ's perspective. And they have, maybe have grown up in a household that has been heavy on the condemnation or perhaps are in an abusive relationship in which a partner or a friend has cursed their life or spoken ill will into their life rather than investing in their life with blessings. And people start to believe things that others say about them. And then, of course, there are those various situations in, say, marriage counseling when I've met with couples where somebody is speaking about the, their loved one or their partner, and I just have to stop and say, look, you're using these words, it's just not true. You're building expectations that this person is living up to, but it's not encouraging, it's not helpful. Over the past few years, I've read many different articles about various things about how to get on in life and how to go through life and coping and they say these days that self-talk is really important. If you have a job interview or if you have a hurdle in life or perhaps you have a very stressful business meeting or there's anxiety that you have to face, talk to yourself. Articles recommend that you go in front of the mirror and you, you build yourself up. Let the words come out of your mouth so they can hear them. Things that we say have power. The opposite is also true. Have you ever brooded before? You know, you isolate yourself and you're brooding and you're angry and you're resentful and you spend days and days plotting against another person or brooding that you've been hurt or perhaps you live in a certain bubble and have built yourself up in a way that now you're angry and upset and then when you go and talk to the person or you talk to a friend, it all spills out and then you realize that if you just talked about it at the beginning, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Or... My favorite, you have a good idea, or you think you have a good idea, and you think about your idea, and maybe you may sleep on it the next morning, you go to work, and you say, boss, I have a good idea, and as soon as it leaves your mouth, you regret you even said it. Yeah. And then you say, you make up for it, you backpedal, and you say, you know, it sounded better in my head, but now that I hear myself saying it, not so good. There's indeed power in the things that we say out loud, not only to one another, but to ourselves as well. And this is also true of our confession, of our profession of faith. What we say shapes how we see ourselves in Christ, how we see our church family. What we say also shapes our truth about what we know the gospel to be true. That power in the word, and for us, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, is an important word. And often the things that we say to one another can either help us grow in Christ or hinder us in Christ. And this is true, I'm sure, for Paul as well. Our lesson today comes from a bigger section, Romans 9 through 11, in which Paul is wrestling with the question of Israel and of the Jews. I have to remind you that the letter is written to churches in Rome. And there are issues in that church in that some are discriminating against Jewish Christians. And so Paul is leveling the playing field, telling them that they're all fallen short of the glory of God, and all of them are in need of salvation, and God, through God's grace, offers them all salvation. And in chapters 9 through 11, there is this poetic movement of how God has uh, recognized a remnant of Israel, those who believe, just as there are some Gentiles whose hearts have been hardened, and that those who come to salvation, who believe in Jesus, shall be saved. We read in our lesson today that God shows no partiality, neither to the Jew nor the Greek. And really what Paul is talking about here is the magnitude of God's grace and love. Of how God has thrown the doors open wide, has laid out those petals of love to welcome all who call upon the name of the Lord. And we see here, specifically in verses 9 and 10, that Paul is very intentional about trying to shape the words we use, in which he says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, surely you shall be saved. I hear that, amen. <laughs> there are two movements that Paul has for us. One is the outward expression of trust, of faith. 
in which we profess and confess with our lips the words come out of our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and the inner movement of trust and faith, of illumination, in which we believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, and that he is Lord not because he's a historical figure stuck in time, nor a person stuck in a grave, but rather a living, risen Savior who lives today. You see, for many of us, we may believe in God. It may be an intellectual exercise. Maybe we even pretend to be Christian on some days. But until we hear ourselves say the words, until we go from our faith from being pretend an intellectual exercise to something we say and live out and express with our lips and have boldness to talk about with others, that's when it becomes real. So confession speaks and gives power to the truth that Christ is Lord. And you know as well as I do that when you say things out loud, it really starts to shape the heart, and the heart soon follows. And it starts to shape how we see the world around us. For one, when Paul tells his, the churches that they are to confess that Jesus is Lord, we have to remember where they live. This is the seat of the Roman Empire. They are their neighbors with Caesar, who is king and lord over the entire empire. And what Paul is saying, when he says that you confess on your lips that Jesus is Lord, is he's saying that Caesar is not Lord. In fact, it was common back then to have a quip to go around and say, Caesar is Lord, Caesar is Lord, praise Caesar, Caesar is Lord. And that was not only a political statement, it was also a theological statement. If you look at the theology and the mythology surrounding the Caesar, you would note that there was a belief that Caesar was God in the flesh, that not only had he, had he a right to rule over the people, but he also had a divine mandate to rule from the gods. And so when you said that Caesar is Lord, you're saying with a political statement that he's in charge, and a theological statement that God, that he is God divine, or has a divine spirit about him. So when Paul is telling them that they are to confess that Jesus is Lord, in no small amount of words, he's basically telling them to commit treason. And it would have been treasonous for them to say that someone other than Caesar is Lord. And only a few short years passed before their thrones alliance, and eventually blamed for the burning of Rome, in which Nero and others like Domitian come down to oppress the Christians, because the confession that they boldly preach that Caesar is not in charge, but rather it is Jesus who is Lord, and he is Lord over all of heaven and on earth, and earth is his footstool. See, it's a protest against those who think they're in power. It's a protest against the, the violence that Rome perpetuated, or the peace that was a mere illusion through the military might of this occupying power. It was a protest against an economy in which those who had honor and gained honor used that honor at the expense of others. You have to remember that this Jesus was one who condescended to us and became not only flesh, but a servant. One who did not consider equality with God, but rather came down in order to serve us, to be born not in the central seat of power in Israel, but in the outskirts of Nazareth in order to show that in God's economy, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. If you don't believe me, just read Philippians chapter 2, where Paul talks, uh, talks about Jesus coming to be servant. It is an oath written to Philippi, a Roman colony, a military colony, who would have surely known that Caesar not only was Lord, but that the military might of Rome instilled what they saw as peace and justice. But Paul knows, and Jesus testifies in his own ministry, that the economy of God's kingdom works in a different way. And so, for one to confess that Jesus is Lord, there is this protest against the world that they would have known, and the world in which they would have worked, and the very power that would have oppressed so many. And this was very public. And it came at the cost of their lives. You have to remember these are Roman churches. They had jobs. They had families. But again, you have to go back to Romans chapter 1, where Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is it has the power to save the Jew first and then the Gentile. And he's talking about this idea that he knows that they're being shamed in community because of what they confess. But in God's eyes, they are honored and lifted up. 
Perhaps they recall Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, when Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father. To say that Jesus is Lord got real. It made it real. And it was a threat to their well-being. And certainly a life that would have been shaped by the cross, rather than an earthly crown. So, confessing Jesus as Lord reminds us that Caesar is not Lord. But another thing that happens, something else that happens when we say and confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord, is it reminds us that we are not Lord. That I am not Lord. And that you are not Lord. You see, you go back a few verses in chapter 10, verse 3, and Paul says that the reason why so many people miss the boat of salvation is because they're not willing to submit to God's righteousness. And so to confess Jesus as Lord is an act of submission. It's an act of surrender. It is a reminder that not only Caesar is not Lord, but I am not Lord either. And when I come into a relationship with Christ, I move over and allow Jesus to be Lord of my life. In which Jesus has the final say in my life. In which Jesus' Lordship commands and dictates the direction of my life. It is an affirmation of surrender to Christ as Lord. And moves the heart to that place of belief and faith. Now Paul works this out throughout the rest of Romans, or the next few chapters. He works this out in this idea of confessing with our lips, and this act of confession and of submission, moving into our heart, and then later in chapter 12, moving into our minds and bodies, including, uh, allowing us to include the entirety of all of who we are to come in submission to Christ Jesus as Lord. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, present yourselves, your bodies as living sacrifices. And do not be conformed to the world, but rather be transformed in the renewing of your mind. To know what God's perfect and pleasing will is. See, Paul is moving us from the magnitude and the majesty of God's grace to this place of surrender and of confession and of this idea of submitting all of who we are to the Lord. Of making sure that we say, Jesus is Lord. We mean it. That it makes a difference in our life. It makes a difference in how we go about living not only in our church or in our community, in our families, but also in the public sphere, that it makes a difference of knowing who's in charge and who's not. Of allowing all of us, from our mind, to our body, to our lips, to our heart, to be submitted to Christ Jesus. See, when you speak, that's when things start to happen. And I think Paul had this in mind. You ever have a situation where you were afraid to say something? Or perhaps you had an issue where you didn't want to talk about it. And there's a fear that if you talk about something, it's as if you're going to lose control by saying the words or by articulating something. It's as if you're going to uh, release a bird that is going to take flight and perhaps never return home. And so we're fearful to say things often because we're afraid that it's at that point that when we say something that is true, when we talk about what haunts us deeply, when we talk about our deepest vulnerability, that somehow we're going to lose control. That we're going to break down. That something is going to happen or that our words will take shape that we might not expect. We allow that bird to fly and build a nest somewhere else. There's risk involved when we say something. Too often when somebody comes to me, they've been brooding or they've been upset. And they said, I was afraid to say something. Well, why? I don't know. I was just afraid. And I say, it's because you want to control it. You want to hold it in so that you can control it. So so that you can remain resentful or remain mad or that you can control? Are you afraid of saying what needs to be said because you feel like you're going to break down? Sure enough, the release comes when we articulate that. I think the same is true for our faith. We like it to be an intellectual exercise because then we can just push it aside. But when we start talking and start confessing with our lips that Jesus is Lord, that bird takes flight and we're afraid of what might happen. That we need to lose control and allow Jesus to come and take control of us. There's risk in that. And there's a threat to our own self-pride. And that's what we're scared of most. I think today as we think about this lesson, there are several things we need to take home with us. One, I think you need to hear yourself confess that Jesus is Lord. Sometimes we need to hear ourselves say it. 
because it's been a matter of being an intellectual exercise for so long, we need to remind each other and remind ourselves of what our life is all about. And the other thing is I think other people need to hear us say it. Other people need to hear us confess that Jesus is Lord. Paul moves from this text in 9 and 10 over to verse 14 and asks very plainly, how will they know and how will they hear without someone to proclaim Christ? And so we need to let the bird go. We need to let the bird take flight. We need to take that risk. We need to lose control of our words sometimes by professing Christ is Lord. We need to hear ourselves say it. We need to look in the mirror and say, Christ is Lord. What does this mean for me? And then we need, and then other people need to hear us say it. For their own sake. Because we meet far too many people who are held in bondage. We need to find release in Jesus Christ. We need to have the permission and the safety to say the things that they need to say. And that has been enslaving them for so long. You need to hear yourself say it. Others need to hear you say it. For how will they hear without someone to proclaim that Christ is the Lord? Amen. Let us pray.